I was here last night. There was some serious stuff going on here last night. <laughs> I think some of us are just tired, man. We were like, wow. There was some unbridled joy in worship going on. And uh, very, it just all types of different songs. And, but man, there are a couple of songs. I thought that dude was going to pull a hamstring or something up there, but it was powerful. But um, you know what? I'm grateful to be here. I got too much to say, too little time. So you're just going to have to be ready. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm going to just jump in. I'm going to pray first, though, because I got to get my heart, you know. Oh, Lord, we are grateful for your grace. Amazing is a word that definitely describes it, but we could probably go deeper if words could. Thank you for how much you love us. We just pray we can even reflect on that in this moment. And thank you for your care and concern. Thank you for showing us how to love, defining it for us, how you sacrifice for us. You give us freedom to even choose not to follow you or love you back. And uh, you are amazing. And I just pray this morning that we can uh, engage with our hearts and our minds. Just have, the, have ears to hear, eyes that see, and, and really hearts that truly take in what you want us to take in, Lord. So I just pray for that to happen right now. And I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, you know, we've, uh, a few years ago, we really felt like we needed to plan our messages ahead of time, and we thought it would be a, a wise approach, not that it's the greatest ever, but we just felt called to do that. And uh, as you can tell, we've had different series and just trying to maybe sit on a subject for a little while, hoping that it can kind of penetrate and go in instead of maybe just, you know, different messages all the time. And, um, you know, we, as Kendall alluded to earlier, uh, we decided there are some topics that maybe you don't necessarily teach every single year. You know, we might not go through the book of Zephaniah every single year, but uh, there are some topics that it just feels like in a, in a church family we should emphasize pretty regularly. And uh, one of those things is the concept of giving. I mean, uh, stewardship and that concept of what God has given us, let's take care of it. Let's be good stewards of it. And that just seems like something that we need, felt like we needed to do more consistently. And so that's our kind of our stewardship concept. We're going to spend a few weeks on that. And you might be, well, what does this word stewardship mean? I mean, I think the Bible hits it from different ways. Um, I, like, I like the passage in 1 Peter 4. I really do. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I think that's a great approach to understand what stewardship is about. Something that you received. You didn't create it or you didn't earn it. You received it from God. And uh, so why hoard it? That makes sense. And, and if you need more help, I appreciate the psalmist. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. So I think God's running things. We might want to keep that in mind, right? And I'd also think, you know, we love because he first loved us. I mean, that kind of really gets that. If love is the greatest kind of scriptural ethic there is, Old Testament and New, love for God, love for our neighbor. If that's truly it, how do we even know what love is? Because God loved us first. And that's why we can even give to somebody else. We serve because he first served us, that whole concept. <clears throat> and so, um, so here's something for you. I'm going to hit this because I want to. <laughs> what do orange slices and oil changes have in common? Hmm, there's a little riddle for you. If I was Michael Burns, I'd have had an actual car come up on stage <laughs> and uh, juggle oranges over here, but I'm not that good. So, what do these have in common? I'll tell you what they have in common. I was, uh, I've been, you know, I had little kids at one point, they were little, sign them up for something at the YMCA. Oh, daddy, I want to play soccer. Okay, cool, let's go. Go to the YMCA. Guess what? You're on the team, great. Okay, here's the list. What's this list? This is what you're, you sign up. If your kid's on the team, you got to provide snacks after the game. You just choose which one you want to, oh, okay, cool. I sign up. Orange slices, you know, amen. That's, my, that's what you do. You're on the team. Everybody, how crazy would it be if I said, no, nah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to sign up. So wait, so your kid is going to come, Mr. Hickman, to the games and the other parents are going to provide, but you ain't? That would be crazy, wouldn't it? 
That doesn't make any sense, right? You say, oh, change. Okay, so my kid, that's the YMCA. Okay, finally, my kids are older. Varsity, high school, soccer, right? Public school, right? Make the team parent night. Great. I'm like, I have graduated from the orange slices, right? Amen. (laughs) Oh, no, Mr. Hickman, how you doing? Your daughter's on the team. Congratulations. Here's a packet right here. Your daughter needs to sell at least 10 of these. Every, everybody on the team has to sell 10 of these, $30 each. Uh, and just so you know, there's a, 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 a one for an oil change in there that's worth $35, so it really pays for itself. <laughs> oh, okay. And if you don't want to sell them, that's cool. You just need to write a check for $300. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to say, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna to take care of this here. But what was the concept? The concept is similar to what Brother Kendall talked about last week. You bring your bit to the whole group. And if every, if every teammate can get those $300 that brings it into the program, then we can have, you know, warm-ups and things like that. We can do other things. But again, what if I just said, nah, I'm good. I, I want to be on the team, though. Oh, I want, you, I want the coach to stay up late, put game plans together. Work, go to the games on the sidelines, teach my kids lessons and all that stuff, but I'm not willing to give to the program. That doesn't make sense, right? And so when we talk about stewardship, guys, here's the deal. I've received messages about giving and stewardship before, and uh, there's two approaches. There are many, but there's two I want to highlight. One approach is basically to assume that pretty much everyone in the audience actually is kind of in rebellion against God. And kind of like, you know what, almost would I say bad hearted and need to be kind of whipped in the shape because just not acting right. And you kind of need to kind of a little bit of a, you you need to do this right now kind of vibe. Maybe even leaning into the shaming kind of vibe. I'm just being honest. That's one approach that I've actually sat down in certain years of my life. Not here, so I ain't pointing no fingers, right? (laughs) There's another approach. And that is, you know what? People have pretty good hearts. We just haven't talked about it much. It's kind of like as a parent, right? If I want my kids, when people come to my house, if I want my kids to actually be nice to them (laughs) and not just keep watching TV, or looking at their phones and people walk in the house and they just, you know, do one of those and keep doing that. If I actually want them to greet them, hi, how are you? Hey, can I get you a water or anything, Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so? If I want that to happen, guess what I have to do? I got to talk about it. Do it yourself. Right? I got to do it myself. These are the kind of things that we got to do. So we would do the family devo and I'd, I'd be knocking at the door and then they open the door. Hi, you know, we practice. I know y'all did the same stuff. Why in the world, why would I get down on them if I haven't taken the time to teach them? That's on me. And so that's what I mean. I'm here to say that to the extent that I think we haven't talked about giving at this church, that's on me. I'm taking responsibility. I'm not blaming on any other minister at this church. It's on me. I'm the one that really spearheads planning the services as far as the lessons, and those are some of the things that I've done. I have neglected this topic. So I'm not down on anybody in this room. I sincerely believe there are good hearts in the room. We just haven't talked about it that much. If anything, I've seen this same group of people, when something is presented, when when the information is given, when something is taught about, you usually respond. Quite honestly, that's, that's what I've seen. So of the two options, I'm going for option two. Y'all are good-hearted. I've, I've neglected to talk about it enough, and we're going to try to rectify that next few weeks. One of the passages that I appreciate is we're going to look at, we're only going to look at two passages. And the first one is in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6. Appreciate Tom Brown because uh, he, he always kind of really reinforces and reminds uh, those of us he, as in the ministry, like, hey, it's good to read First, Second Timothy and, you know, the pastoral epistles, Titus, and it's, it's really about an uh, older minister trying to teach younger ministers how to lead a church, right? And so he's really hammers at home, keep reading it, keep reading it. So I spent time in First Timothy just really trying to get my own convictions. And I appreciate this part of it in chapter 6. 
here's Paul telling the younger minister, telling him, hey, these are the things you ought to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is actually a means to financial gain. And you know what I sat on here? And, and this is what made me even say what I just said. You know, you got, I got to provide sound instruction from Jesus and godly teaching. And I haven't done that to the extent I feel like I need to, right, on this topic, right? And so I, I read that and I said, man, you know, I got to grow. I got to grow right there. On, and, and so we're going to talk about these things because the reality is, is money is weird with people, especially, you know, right? And, you know, and sometimes even, even teachers and some of these false teachers had infiltrated the, ter- the church and Paul's even calling them out and sometimes some of these teachers actually will try to teach in a way that benefits them financially themselves right. and here's the deal man I don't want no Learjet I ain't into that prosperity gospel I name it right now and call it out that's not what we preach about here that's trash that's spiritual trash when I go, Abraham was wealthy, that means every single person ought to be wealthy. Man, that's ridiculous exegesis. That's not how we, that, no, no, so I don't believe in that. And if you give more, it ain't like somebody in administration is giving me a kickback. <laughs> that ain't happening either. So let's just name that. Let's put that out there. Oh, we got extra baptisms. Woo, I get a bonus. And that's not how it works. <laughs> so let's. There's no financial gain for me personally. I still live in the same house I lived in 17 years ago when I moved here. I mean, it's just, you know the deal. But I just need to name that because sometimes people have weird feelings about money in the church because there are some jokers out there that are milking people for money under the the guise of Christianity. And that ain't right. And, And if we do that here, may God strike us down. But godly, you want to know what great gain is? Be godly, you know, but be content. Amen. Now that's gain. Oh, well, let's drill down with, with this biblical contentment. This is, the, this is the, the godly teaching part right here, right? We brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. You thought that was just a saying. That's from the Bible. But isn't it true? Isn't it true? But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. I, I looked at this and I said, but honestly, Jeff, <laughs> you could even write, but if we have food and clothing, will we be content with that? I don't know if some of us are. Because we live in a country that loves money. <laughs> Please, I love my country, but God, come on, guys. Money, <laughs> money runs this place. It has for a long time. Let's just own it. Free market, this, that, capital. I mean, we just think it's the greatest thing ever. More money. So let's look at the godly teaching right here about, let's look at some of these phrases. Those who want to get rich, I almost set y'all up. I almost said that at the beginning. Hey, raise your hand if you want to get rich, because I know some of y'all have been like that. (laughs) But I didn't set you up. I'm trying to be nice. (laughs) Those who want to get rich, be honest with yourself. Do you want to get rich? fall into temptation and a trap. It's a temptation. So Jeff, you saying that I'm in sin if I want to get rich? That's not what the scripture said. Temptation is not sin. So let's, let's, you, I think what Paul's getting at is you running after money like that. Like I want, like food and clothing, the necessities, you're not content with that. You, you're going, you're trying to gain more. You, he's like, you're opening yourself up to a trap. You know what I'm saying? And what's the deal with a trap? A trap is you didn't know it was there. That's the point of a trap. You know what I'm saying? I was doing homework one night, and I could have sworn I saw something in the side of my eye. You know what I mean? I was like, nah, you know, whatever. I'm just doing it. Must be me. And then later on, it was quiet, and I heard. I'm like, oh, man, there's something up over there. I call up the exterminator dude. He come out the next day. I appreciate it. 
I said, bro, we got to deal with this here because my wife, <laughs> it's not going to be good, bro. <laughs> he said, uh, he said, Mr. Hickman, you got any peanut butter? I said, yeah, I got some peanut butter. He said, all right, man. So he, he get out a little box, put some scoop of peanut butter in there. He said, where that thing come out? I said, right over here. He go, open it. Put that thing down right there. <laughs> all right. Next morning, I came downstairs. I looked over that spot. Oh, yeah, my man was in there. <laughs> and he was trying to gnaw at the, at the paper around, you know, that was covering him up. But see, the peanut butter trapped him. And he sat up there. He's, oh, I got some peanut butter. He, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the problem was, he didn't realize the longer he's sitting there eating that peanut butter, his feet sticking to the thing at the bottom. And he did. He tried to leave. He done got enough to eat. Whoa, I can't eat. You know, uh-oh. Uh, and he's stuck, and he's trying to eat his way out. He got trapped. <laughs> he didn't see it coming. And you don't see it coming either with your love for money. You don't see it coming. I'm going to tell you what, if I put $200 down there, that mouse would have come up and been like, I don't need that. I don't care about no money. The money wouldn't have trapped the mouse. Mouse ain't got no use for no money. But you do. You got to watch out. Because you don't know. It'll trap you. It'll catch you. And it, and, it, and it traps you to many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money. So you got want to get rich, loving money is a root of all kinds of evil. It could have just simply said is a root of evil, but he talked all kind of evil. I mean, he's just bringing it out. Some people, what does it say? Eager for money. You got those who want to get rich, love money, eager for money. Do you get the picture? You know what happens? They wander from the faith. Wow. And they pierce themselves with many griefs. This is godly teaching on money. Look at your own heart. Do you want to get rich? And do you love money? And are you eager for money? Do you orient your life to where you need more and more and more? And do you struggle with contentment for what you have? Because you know what? Paul, I appreciate it. He said, all right, man, this is the deal. But he, then he's going to give some instruction. He said, but look, Timothy, you, if you really are a man of God, I like how he said, hey, man of God, let me remind you who you are. You, people of God, all of you, me included, all of us, we need to flee from all of that. Flee. That's like quick running. Free from it and pursue righteousness, right? Godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness right there. You want something to talk about in your family group this week? Talk about those words. Figure out what those words mean. The concept of righteousness, that justice, that right relationship, that godliness, that faith, that fidelity, that not just belief, allegiance, that love, even willing to sacrifice, even to t take care of somebody else, even above yourself, endurance, sticking it out, persevering, even with people and through situations, and gentleness. Wow, interesting how he connects that with gentleness. What a great faith, they, what great study there. Pursue gentleness. And oftentimes this concept is definitely treated for those that are on the margins of life, the underside of humanity. So you, pursue, you flee, what, what else does it say? Flee, fight the good fight of the faith. Don't be fighting to get rich, eager to do, don't fight that. Fight the fight of, of faith. That's the good fight. How do we fight the good fight of faith? It can be done in a million ways. <laughs> but you care about what God cares about, and then you go out and be a light and salt to this world. And you take hold of the eternal life. I mean, I like these words. Flee the, the craziness. Fight the good fight. Take hold. If you want to act and do something, these are the things to be pursuing in your life. This is what, should, what our lives should look like as followers of Jesus. Because this is the life that God has for us. Not the one that the world, man, our adversary is setting traps everywhere. He got peanut butter all over the place. <laughs> waiting for you. 
He's good at it. He's been good at it since the garden, man. I mean, he know how to just get in there and just whoop, get you. God's like, I got life for you. Take hold of it. But if, you, if your hand is full of trying to get rich in money, you ain't going to have time, room to take hold of the life God want to give you. So you got to watch out. You got to watch out. Jeff, are you saying that rich people are sinful? No. That's not what I'm saying, people. But you need to hear the sound instruction of Scripture. These things, are, they can mess with you. When you made that good confession, you know, we love when people say, Jesus, Lord, we love clapping right before their baptism. That good confession. All right, well, if that's your good confession, then Jesus needs to be the Lord of how you view money. Straight up. So it's not just godly teaching. It was the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus. And I was like, you know, we got to let Jesus speak into this topic too. And I was like, of all the passages, which one was I drawn to for for whatever reason? Uh, How about open up your Bibles because I'm not putting it on the screen. Uh, Or turn on your Bible or however you do it. Luke chapter 12. We're going to read some there. Luke 12. So we got sound godly instruction. Now we got teachings of Jesus. Luke 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Hey, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus said, man, I love that about Jesus. Jesus was a brother. You know what I'm saying? Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? What I love about this is like, man, I'm not here. You know what? I'm not spending my time here arbitrating between these kind of things. If I do this, the line going to be up. I'm not a lawyer. That's not what I do. I'm not here for all of that. Maybe it was the younger brother trying to get a little more. I don't know. Luke doesn't tell us, but what Luke does tell us is Jesus immediately pivots from this dude asking him a question. He said, oh, let let me go ahead and talk about something. Verse 15, he said to them, watch out, exclamation point. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. An abundance of possessions. If this doesn't describe America, I don't know. I mean, it's a unique temptation for this country. We, guys, we're not living in, in, in certain parts of the world where it's rough. And hey, it's rough here. I know in certain parts, I know, but come on. I mean, America, we, we got a, there's a lot here that can be had. And some of us really are eager to get the abundance of possessions. And so Jesus said, you got to watch out for that. And he told him this parable, you know, the ground of a certain man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool! Exclamation point again. (laughs) Jeff, that wasn't there in the Greek, I know, but you got to work with me. Because there is a vocative voice in the Greek, which basically means exclamation point. (laughs) This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepare for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. I love this country. We have a problem with me, 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 and I, I, I. I'm sorry. It's in our DNA. I'm sorry. It's in there. Some cultures are more communal, not this one. (laughs) We are an I, me culture. This passage should resonate deeply with us. We tend to lean into what about me and mine. And I love how Jesus tells the story. 
What yielded the surf, what, what yielded the great crop? The ground. It wasn't even the dude, right? It's the ground of a certain man. I ain't even gonna name him, but just a certain man. And if you want to do another cool study, check out the rich man and Lazarus in this parable and see the similarities. Ooh, very interesting study. So the land gives an abundant harvest, and, he, and immediately he's like, what shall I do? I have no place but my crops. And what, you're, what you need to see is the number of times I and my are in this passage. And there's a correlation between a love for money, eager to get rich, and a consumption problem where you benefit yourself to the neglect of even mentioning anyone else. That's the problem here. Because the reality is, I don't know nothing about this farm, but you got to be a pretty amazing farmer to go till the land, plant all the seeds, water it, fertilize it, and then when harvest time comes, you do it all, you did, oh, he did that all himself? Probably not. Probably had a lot of laborers. Maybe even got some family, who knows? <laughs> but they don't get mentioned. It's all about him. It's his. It's no thanking God, wow, what a great year. Wow, the sun was just the right amount, the rain just the right amount, the wind went, it didn't get too cold too early. Thank you, God. None of that. And you know, I, I mean, so many people can, can get that way, and, and even in our, where we are in our culture. Man, I earned everything. I, I'm sure you went to work and you worked hard. But all I'm saying is, where is God in all of it? It's my right. Don't mess with my money. I made it. I worked hard. I got education. I made this decision. I made this investment. I, that's fine, dude. Amen. Good, glad. Happy for you. Where's God in the conversation, though? Who else are you helping? Who else are you benefiting? Are you caring about another person? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself with all your wealth? Are you willing to give it away? Or is all you can talk about is more and this and what you can do next and that? And that's the problem that this guy has, and that's the trap that many of us are. We are living and swimming and breathing in this kind of culture. And what I love is when my man in verse 19 said, man, I'm going to take life easy. I'm going to take life easy. <laughs> and what I appreciate about God, he said, you know what? That, this night, that life that you take, I'm going to take it from you. Same word. He thought he was in control of his own life. You didn't bring nothing into this world, and you ain't taking nothing with you. You didn't bring yourself into the world. Your life ain't yours. And if you're a follower of Jesus, your money ain't yours. It's not mine. It's not the preacher. Don't, not, don't, I'm not trying to take your money for my personal gain, but you got to figure out, are you giving to God, to the church? You say, well, I'm not necessarily technically giving to God. Okay, that's fine, but you are giving to the local congregation, which is what we talked about last week, the body of Christ, the imperfect body of Christ, because we are some jacked up people. Nobody here is perfect. We don't always take care of people perfectly. We don't always do great things. We actually make mistakes because we are a group of imperfect people. So if, you're, if, you, <laughs> if that's your criteria, all right, cool. Then you need to divest all your money out of every broker you got because I know them jokers making mistakes with your money too. All right, then take it out of everything you, because what organization of human beings is completely free of problems here and there? But praise God, we've been audited. We got these types of things. I feel like we're doing what we can to be above board. But the thing is the heart. It's the heart. And I think, you know what? I need to talk more about these types of things. Let's give. And some of us, here's the deal. Let me say it to you straight up. If you've moved here from a sister congregation and you come here, you need to give. I don't understand that. How do you come receive. Josh up here singing. Josh was up here singing his heart out last night. I don't know how his voice works <laughs> right now. Seriously. I mean, just give it. Some of us, man, we got to really, I think some of us fall into this trap. We look around and we say, oh, there's so many people here. Everything must be good. I don't, you know, my little bit doesn't matter. I'm not worried about, what I'm worried about is your heart. Yeah. It's really not, it's really not the amount of money. I've come to the conviction that it's more important to talk about this because if, you're, if you can't give, there really is probably something wrong with your heart before God. Like there's, a, there's like a disease in there or something jacked up. 
And, and, and just in out of love, like, you got to check your heart. If you can show up to a place, listen to a message, sing songs other people have been preparing, park because somebody helped you park, drop your kids off that you don't even serve in the children's ministry, and you can come week after week and never financially give. There's something wrong with your heart. I, I, and I, I'm saying this out of love. I'm not coming from a place of, like you're a bad person. I'm just saying, dude, like this is a problem. Like high blood pressure. It's a problem. Like deal with it. Like you should not come here every week and give not a penny. Th- that, ain't, that ain't right. It ain't right. No more than it ain't right for me to look at the sheet and say, I ain't giving no snacks. But my kid will eat your snacks when it's your turn to bring them. <laughs> Just, it just doesn't work that way. So, so it's out of love. It's out of love, man. I, I mean, I'm just trying to be real. And, 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 the, and the reality is I really believe that some of y'all come every week and don't give. Check your heart. It's a trap. It's a trap. Take time to pray regarding your financial giving. And ask for the Spirit's guidance. Pray about it in your closet or with your group or your spouse or whatever. And take the time to pray about how you can serve. You know, not not just give financially, but serve. How can you serve? I mean, if you have children in children's ministry, at some point during the year, you should serve at least one time, right? How can you just drop off every week when other people are just taking care of your wonderful snot-nosed kid. You know what I'm saying? Because my kid was back there too, my kids, and we had those moments. Oh, Jeff, Christy, can we talk to you? Like, oh man, my kid done made your life crazy. Oh, my bad, I'm sorry. Because we want you to give, give from a place of gratitude, not coercion. And if I've struck a wrong note, let me know. You know what I'm saying? Let a brother know. But you know what? Take time to thank God for what he has given you. And you may need to get yourself on a few-month plan to get where you need to be. Amen, man. I'm not trying to make nobody feel weird, but I am trying to make you think and check your heart. And uh, we're going to say a prayer and uh, doing a little different this week. I'm going to say a word of prayer. And uh, we have, we're going to have the offering after the prayer, right? Most of you give online anyway. Uh, we'll have instructions on how you can give. And we have a place in the, in the foyer where you can give as well. And we're going to give you more of a kind of a, not a sermon, but just to give you an update on where the church finances are. Because like I told you earlier, the history of this congregation is when you know the information, you typically respond. And that's from where we're coming from. More information we give to you, and then you choose between you and God. Figure out what you're going to do. But what you, but I'm going to say it one more time, what you should not do is give absolutely nothing to this congregation. That's a trap. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you help us. We need you. I pray we can have a spirit of contentment with what we have. I pray that how we view money, how we spend our money, how we talk about money is categorically different than the culture around us to where even in conversations with other people, they might even ask us, wow, Why do you think that way? And we could just share about how much we appreciate you and how you have given so much to us and we're just giving out of gratitude. Help us with that. I do pray our giving can reflect the hearts of a grateful group of people. Please bless our offerings in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.